Hello and welcome to Ways to Change the World. I'm Krishna Giri Murthy and this is the podcast in which we talk to remarkable people about the big ideas in their lives, how they see the world and the events that have helped shape what they believe. And my guest today is Matt Britton. Now, he's the man who runs Google in Europe, the Middle East and Africa. He is the man you will have seen over the years defending the company from a variety of onslaughts from politicians to uh, to, to news media. Um, and he's, uh, he's, he's got a, a very interesting CV because he was a, a British rower. He was a, a Cambridge rower, uh, went into business, became a, a business consultant, the media, and then onto Google and is now one of Google's longest standing executives. Um, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, what's your basic mission? Personally? Yeah. Well, it's interesting, you know, thinking about, as you talk about what I've done over time, uh, starting off in sport and trying to be successful in sport and get the best out of yourself and other people. And actually, if I look back, that's sort of what I've tried to do in the business world as well. And one of the things that's really fascinated me is, is how we learn. Um, so whether it's, you know, I, why did I do rowing? Frankly, because I was rubbish at everything else, particularly ball sports, despite having parents who were really good. Um, and But learning something where you get taught exactly how to move, but then you have to work on how you move with other people. And then moving into the the world of business, there was a long, long gap between stopping rowing, which is a tough decision to do, you know, admitting I wasn't going to win that Olympic gold, and, uh, and then getting to Google through different adventures, trying to find out what I was good at and not good at. So for me, there's something about how I learn and we learn, and in particular the last 20 years, how we put technology to use for good, for society, for jobs and prosperity and so on. And a lot, as you say, a lot of what I do is spend time thinking about that question and engaging increasingly with policymakers about how... Uh, we get the rules of the road right for the digital world. So what is your job? I mean, because Google is basically a, a West Coast California yeah. business, uh, but a huge amount of money is made here in Europe. Are you, are you basically a middleman? Well, yeah, to, to an extent, I guess that's absolutely fair. I wouldn't, uh, would, wouldn't overplay my role. But I mean, uh, yeah, Google tries to make products that work, tools really, that work for everyone around the world. And my job is to try to make sure that those, tr those tools work brilliantly in each of the countries that I'm responsible for. And that, you know, um, that users love them and that um, on the business side, because Google's mainly funded by advertising, so that it's mainly hundreds of thousands of small businesses that go online and when you search for cycling shoes, up pop their, their cycling shoes offer. So that's one of the transformational things that Google's done. So make sure that we have customers for whom Google works and then increasingly to help ensure that in each country we're respectful of the culture and um, we're engaged in the discussion about how that country can make the most out of the digital world. So it's really trying to make Google work in all those countries, um, but also help Google understand those countries. And that's an increasingly important part of the job, because if you think about Europe and technology, you know, the questions around privacy and security, uh, copyright, content actually are arising in, in Europe first, and are probably challenging that West Coast, not just Google, but the sort of West Coast vision of the open internet. And I think quite a lot of my job is about um, going between and trying to sort of understand how technology can better serve what Europeans are asking for. You didn't go into the world of work thinking you were going to work in technology, did you, I suppose? You know, and no. you talk about being in business rather yeah. than yeah. being a technology person. Um, I mean, this interview is usually, you know, through, through a prism of, you know, what can an individual do to change the world? And um, what I wonder with Google and technology and the internet in general is the world is changing. And really, it's a question of how on earth can we keep up, work out what's yeah. happening, keep it safe? Yeah. You know, do you feel, you know, that you've learned something about who's in control yeah, well, over the last 10 years? Well, start, start with, you know, how we learn, because I think, you know, I started with my own um, story. You know, I graduated from university in 1989, 30 years ago, in the same year that Tim Berners-Lee wrote the memo that led to the creation of the World Wide Web. And I think um, his boss at the time wrote, wrote sort of vague but interesting on it. And I think that probably you could apply that to the internet today. One of the things that when I came into this role about four years ago, I was concerned about was the, the digital skills gap. So how do we make sure that everybody can make the most of this, this world? And the EU actually had published a report that said there's a million jobs that are going unfilled because people haven't got the basic skills that they need in digital. And so I was um, really keen to see if we could make a difference. So we set ourselves a challenge. Can we train a million people in digital skills, the sort of things that not, not being a coder, but like, how do I build a website? How do I do online marketing? Can I use analytics to see how I can sort of make my business grow? And we were blown away, absolutely blown away by the demand. 
um, three years later, we've trained nearly 10 million people. And this is physical training and online training. In, in classrooms in, and... Uh, it's physically together, usually in partnership. So, for example, you know, in Italy, you have a program in partnership with the Chambers of Commerce and the Small Business Association and the Italian government, where we train unemployed young people in the basic digital skills. And then the government uses EU funding to provide bursaries for them to go and work with small businesses. So they go to the small business and help them get online, sell their handbags around the world, etc. And a large number of them have become employed. So what we've learned in that training, we were amateurs. We've always partnered with other people. So there's a real interesting partnership between technology, business. We've partnered with a trade union in Germany, for example. In Italy, we've partnered, as I say, with the government, but also with um, the small industries trade body. Um, and we, we see that um, people who've going, gone through this training in their hundreds of thousands have gone on to start businesses, grow businesses, and get jobs. And we also know that the ones, the businesses that are online are growing faster, exporting more, and creating jobs at a higher rate. So trying to close that digital skills gap has been a real mission for me. How sure are you, though, that um, the, poten the, the, the potential good um, of the internet outweighs the potential bad? Personally, I strongly believe that the, the, the good outweighs the bad. But I think you know, one way to think about it is, imagine we're all living in villages, and suddenly we're moved to an enormous metropolis with hugely exciting potential, lots of exciting stuff going on. We haven't figured out, like, what are the social norms when you're living on top of each other? How do you think about the rules of the road and driving in heavy traffic? You know, are the traffic lights in sequence? Are the, are the police there to, you know, to, to manage uh, transgressions? And I think, you know, that's the way I think about it. It's up to us together to figure out the norms in your family. You know, do you allow your children online the whole time, yes or no? At work, how do we use these tools? And how do we want them to be deployed? And sometimes people paint the picture that, you know, big tech is anti-regulation. And I think, you know, I'd say, that first, firstly, you know, it's not the Wild West. The internet is, is quite heavily regulated by existing laws. But it's true that we need new and updated laws in a number of areas to help all of us figure out how to get the best of this. So in a world where we're now at what Tim Berners-Lee calls the 50-50 moment, we've just passed it, actually. So for the first time, the majority of people on the planet have access. It's hugely positive. Education, skills, learning, all the things I've talked about. But when everybody's there, then you also have the bad actors there. So you have people using the internet to radicalize, um, for child sexual abuse imagery, some of the things that we read about in the headlines. And I think we all have to work together to address and manage those challenges as well. But when, when the service like YouTube was dreamt up, do you think they ever thought, you know, the thing about this is it's suddenly going to be open to the far right, to hate speech, yeah. to paedophiles, to all, you know, all these malign forces that we now worry about. No, I don't think anybody thought when, you know, when Berners-Lee invented the web, when YouTube founders started by putting a video of an elephant at the zoo on YouTube, nobody thought that these tools would get to the scale that they're at now. Partly because, you know, we've both got our smartphones sitting on the desk. Anybody with a smartphone has got the entire internet in their pocket. Um, when you and I were about the same age, I guess, were growing up, you know, only the biggest players in the world had global reach. You know, multinational companies were the only people who could reach you around the world. And today, anyone with a smartphone and a camera can broadcast themselves to the entire world. Now, that's wonderful because it means, like, last night I got home and my son's learning a, a guitar tune from somebody he's never met. But it's also challenging because it means that somebody who wants to radicalize can upload and post a video to YouTube and to do that. And in the last few years, and you've seen this in the headlines, you know, let's take YouTube. We operate uh, and, and own YouTube. We've had to try to figure out, you know, how do you draw the line on what content's allowed on a platform like that? Now, there's a bunch of rules. So the UK government, for example, has prescribed people and has rules about what is and isn't allowed online. But they're not really enough to draw the line in the right way for a platform like, um, like YouTube. So what do we do? Well, we identify we've got a problem. We've got people on there. Um, who are using YouTube to radicalize and, and particularly to incite violence. How do you set a policy that draws that line? You know, so you and I could probably agree if we looked at a bunch of things, what is and is not pornography, for example. Quite hard to get 100 people to agree what is and is not incitement to violence, particularly if it's in multiple languages. So we set out on that task several years ago, um, firstly, to consult with experts. How can we actually define some policies that will allow us to draw the line in the way that's appropriate? Not, not just our point of view, but, but a point of view that's um, supported by society. We then had to get humans to be able to interpret those policies consistently so that 100 people would be able to say yes, no to this. We then used those humans to train machines to classify videos as accurately as humans. 
And then over time, what we've been able to do is find and stop those videos being seen. So like 70 or 80% of the videos like that that are uploaded to YouTube now are not seen by anybody. We've also built partnerships with people who help us by being trusted reviewers of videos to try to address and remove those content. And in some cases, you know, we work in partnership with the industry. So, you know, people think we're at loggerhead sometimes with policymakers. Um, for the last three or four years, I've been to the European um, uh, Parliament building and sat in a room alongside, the first year I went actually, the Home Secretary of the UK was Theresa May and all of the Home Security Ministers uh, in Europe, alongside tech company representatives. And we've talked about how do we fight violent extremists online. And we actually put in place a whole bunch of measures working together things like um, training uh, Europol, the Home Office and other to use tools to help investigate what's going on online, things like building better systems ourselves, things like sharing our technology with others in the industry. So if we see a video that is not, should not be allowed, we can notify our industry peers, Facebook, Twitter, and other platforms, and they can stop it ever getting in front of a user. So there's actually quite a lot that's gone on in the fight against um, that sort of extremism. But it is very complex, isn't it, as you say? I mean. You know, right, right now, um, you know, we're going through this whole Tommy Robinson question. Mm -hmm. So Facebook have taken him mm -hmm. down. He's still on YouTube mm -hmm. how, because he's very, very careful about how he uses YouTube mm -hmm. uh, and he knows exactly what your policies are. How do you feel about hosting Tommy Robinson on YouTube? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I find his, his point of view on the world abhorrent. Um, and I think it's a very difficult call. And I think what we have to do so you're absolutely right. He's, he's looked, I presume, he's looked at the policies and tried to ensure that any videos on YouTube don't contravene the policies. And our reviewers have taken that view at the moment. Uh, they'll keep it under review. Um, and that's very different from the video content he's used on other platforms, which is why he's been banned uh, elsewhere. What we have to do is um, we have to look across instances like that and check that we think that the policies are in the right place because there is a responsibility here that balances freedom of speech uh, versus um, stopping hate speech and incitement uh, to violence. And I know, I think in this case, I'm, I'm not personally that close to it, but I think in this case, you've had one political leader saying you absolutely should take this off YouTube and another political leader say you absolutely must leave it up there. Um, these videos on YouTube don't get monetized by advertising. They don't get access to the tools other creators have. But you know, from a journalistic point of view, from a public interest point of view, understanding what kind of views are out there, maybe that is useful. And so that's where we're trying to make sure that our policy is in the right place. But, do, but does that make you them. think, the fact that he's able to be on there when he's been banned elsewhere, that your policies are wrong? Or just that you know, that's life and he's clever and you've got to just keep an eye on it? So I think it, it gives you pause for thought all the time when you're dealing with these challenging cases. I think in his instance, as I understand it, the videos are different on different platforms. But I think, you know, it's absolutely an area that's under very close review all the time. And this is never going to be a static game, right? So Because if you were to change your policy because you don't like him, you could change it for anybody. You could exactly. change it for Jeremy Corbyn tomorrow, couldn't exactly. you? Exactly. And I think that's one of the challenging things here is it's not about an individual instance. That's the whole point of having the policies, right? It's, it's in order that you can judge something against a set of norms rather than in the heat of a particular moment, but I think we're always going to get pressure on that from both sides. So should you be the ones who decide is really the well, question, isn't it? It's a, it's a very good question. I think we should be participating in the discussion, which is why I mentioned, you know, that's the forum, the internet forum in, in Europe, which is a good place to exchange views and get input on where we can move. And also consulting with um, a wider set of policies in the creation of policies. And it's also fair to say that these discussions are very different in each country. So you've got these platforms that have a global reach. You know, what's legal and appropriate in Germany around Nazism, for example, is different from in other countries in Europe, and rightly so. That's where I think I started off, you know, mm. sort of have you unleashed something that is just too big mm. to control? Mm. And you can never, you can always pretend to be in control of it, but you're not really. I don't think that's quite as extreme as that. But I do think, you know, if you take, you know, journalism, you know, in a newspaper, uh, despite the fact you're commissioning stories you know, maybe 200 a day from professional journalists, you make mistakes and you have to correct them. And I think, you know, you have to be in a world where you're having zero tolerance of, of mistakes, but you have to also accept that you're not always going to get it right. What's important, I think, is to ensure that you can continue to engage and find the right way so that the overwhelmingly positive benefits of these technologies, and we, we, we're hung up on, I wouldn't say it's an edge issue, but we're, we're hung up on very low numbers of views on a very small number of pieces of content that absolutely have to stop. We need to keep the benefits available to everybody. 
while trying to make sure that the, uh, the issues you have can be contained and reduced to a minimum. If, if you are trying to basically bring the digital world to mm. everybody mm. and those people who are excluded at the moment, mm. I mean, I can see how you can train up um, businesses and mm. individuals who reach out to Google. How do you actually reach the people who are excluded, who don't have yeah. a phone, yeah. you know, who don't have access to a computer? Um, well, I'm responsible for what we do in Africa. And so, you know, when I go and I see what's happening there, it's, it's really inspiring to see how people, when they get connected for the first time, use that technology. What do we do to play our role in helping people access the internet? It's one of the things we've signed up to as part of the World Wide Web Foundation's charter, which is all about Tim Berners-Lee saying we need to make sure that citizens can access the internet in an open way, that their privacy and security is protected and that companies act uh, for the greater good. Um, and when I get to Af Africa, I see that absolutely in practice. Um, so how do we play a role as Google? Well, the first thing is um, the cost of access is a, bit, is a barrier. So we built Android, which is an open source operating system. It's the world's most popular now. It's free to any manufacturer. And as a result of that, you have smartphones you can buy. I went to Kenya and I bought a phone for $32. Um, so that's really massively opening up um, access. It's still not cheap enough for everybody. It's massively opened up access for people. Then you find the barrier um, when you talk to people in Kenya, in Nigeria, in South Africa, is data. So you and I don't know how much it costs to watch a video online or to, you know, to, um, to upload a photograph on data because you know, the data cost is very small relative to what we're spending online uh, in, in our day-to-day -day lives. But you sit in a room uh, full of people in one of those countries and they can tell you exactly how much it costs to do that. So we've tried to build ways of compressing our apps and making them thinner so they work for people of doing things like being able to download over Wi-Fi and watch while you're on the move in order to help them to get access. And then we also have to partner with telcos, who are the people who are ultimately you know, charging for the data, to find ways to help them to offer that at a, a, a lower cost. The question always comes back to how much of the pie you keep, doesn't it? Because mm. mm. you know, money is, is really, really central. And although obviously you're not absolutely in control of everything Google does, um, and there are, you have bosses. What, what is your view of, you know, whether companies like Google need to give back more? Mm. I don't mean through tax necessarily. I mean mm. just in terms of um, how much money you spend. You know, you're, mm. if, if Google is bringing in a hundred million pounds, a mm. hundred mm. billion pounds a year, mm. should it be spending a lot more than it is now? Because you've got the examples, but it's still relatively small. Yeah. So I think. What we haven't talked about is the value that the, all of the products that you know, billions of people are using every day creates for them. So when you think about you know, researching and buying things online, saving people time and money every day, uh, when you think about transportation and um, finding the best route to anywhere, when you think about teaching yourself new skill, skills, you think about posting and managing your files and your photos online, these, these are all things that create what, what economists call huge consumer surplus. I think it's been estimated in the UK that the Google products here create over 55 billion pounds of consumer surplus and value to the economy every year. That's before you get to the value of businesses becoming these sort of micro multinationals exporting around the world or so on. So there's a huge amount of value there. Um, but I do think that we need to do more than just have those products and services work well for everybody in, to create those. So I think the second thing that we try to do is really invest our engineering efforts in things that could have benefits to billions of people in the future. Um, so, for example, within the, the group of companies that, that um, is now operated under Alphabet, which is now the parent of Google, is a self-driving car company, Waymo. There's a million road deaths a year caused by humans. And that company has now proved that cars can drive on the roads more safely than humans. Which, when they started, seemed like science fiction, but actually kind of makes sense because of sensors and processing powers and so on how to get those cars from the, you know, from the lab into the world and saving lives every day. That's a question for policymakers. But what I, what I think you've seen is um, because of the research and the progress that we've made, car manufacturers started investing in systems like that. You start to get competition and now you get cars with some degree of automation and safety features that weren't there before. And as a father of teenagers who are at the stage of starting to drive, you know, I really welcome that. So that's an example, I think, of using the R&D capability and the computer science expertise on things that could have really positive uh, impact on the world. You know, you, you've acknowledged already that there is a gap between people's day-to-day -day 
experience of a product like mm. Google and all the things that Google does and the way Google is perceived by yeah. lots of people. Yeah. We live in a time when obviously there's a huge disconnect between people and politics and the mm. state and business, big business. Mm. Um, you know, is, is it with your business hat on rather than your Google hat mm. on, do you think big business like Google needs to think in new ways about its models and about the way it makes money and how much it keeps? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, we've been through 10 years where real incomes in many countries have been static or falling. Um, and we live in a world where people feel that the your cause of that was the financial crisis and that no one was heard, uh, held to account for the financial crisis and where people rightly theref therefore feel that maybe the system isn't working for them. I'm really conscious of that because many of those people are users of our products and services across, across the world. So in that world, I think there's a higher bar for companies to pass on earning the trust of people who use their services, just as you, you know, Channel 4 News have to earn the trust of your audience through the quality of your journalism. And, and you know, none of us ever get everything right all the time. I think that people do believe that companies can be a force for good. That's certainly what the research uh, tells us, and that's what our users and customers and partners uh, tell us. And I think one of the challenging things is how do you ex explain that? Um, partly it's by delivering for people every day um, quality results, quality services, et cetera. But I do think that's right. You're under more scrutiny. I think actually, particularly in the UK, you know, the media and politicians are quite challenging of business. And uh, I think that's fair, right? And I do think it's appropriate that big in business can be scrutinized. Um, can we do more? Yes. Uh, how do we do more? I think that depends on how we work with other people. And one of the other things I'd say about you know, my experience at Google over 12 years is a lot of it has been about partnership. It's about getting to know other organizations and how we work together. How can we help, for example, journalism to thrive in a digital world? You know, I used to work in the newspaper industry. And you know what's happened in you know, the world of newspapers. People are reading physical papers less. There's more competition. Um, you're competing with your you know, content with free BBC and news from all around the world. How can you help quality content thrive in that environment? How do we stop the fakers? How can we help fund quality content in the digital world? These are all things we work really, really hard on. But do you think it's possible to make too much profit? Yeah, I mean, look, I think, yes, uh, businesses earn a return on innovation. Google's been a highly innovative business and has earned a return on that innovation. Um, and I think we have to invest wisely. Ultimately, you know, profits are returned to shareholders. And so, you know, and the shareholders in big public companies tend to be pension funds and society. So I don't believe that that in itself is a bad thing. But I do think um, when you're successful, the level of responsibility um, that should be expected of you is higher. And the level of scrutiny you should expect is higher. And we certainly get, you know, certainly get the scrutiny. And I think, um, we, wherever we find things that we can do better and improve, we try to do that. And you know, I wouldn't be in the job 12 years in if I didn't believe that you could make those positive changes. So you, you don't you don't fear the revolution. You know, you don't feel the hordes. You know, fear the hordes banging on the door one day coming for you the same way they might go for the banks and the politicians. I, well, no. It's, <clears throat> if I think about the last couple of years in Europe, um, we have uh, you know we, the competition authorities have come and said you know these things you're doing we're not happy with you need to change them we're going to fine you for your behavior previously. We've strongly disagreed, uh, but we have a view, I have a view, that we're here for the long run. And so as the rules unfold, sometimes in ways that you disagree with, you need to play by those rules and continue to sort of show up and demonstrate that you're also a force for good, even though there's disagreement. You, you said Britain is, 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 in Britain, the scrutiny is quite, can be quite uh, intense. How do you, how, what's that like? And how do, you, how do you think you have handled it over the years? Um, I think on a, you know, so on a personal level, um, I've been in front of um, politicians in the UK and select committees um, and in, uh, across Europe in other forums, sometimes public, sometimes not public. Personally, it can be quite tough, I think. You know, let, let's be honest about it. Being in front of a select committee is something that most business leaders would not want to do, and I've heard that from many. But I think it's important to do that because I do think it's important for people to put a face to businesses and to challenge them. It can be tough because you get very tough questions and don't always get the time to answer them to your satisfaction. Um, but I think that scrutiny is important. And I think um, it allows you to um, enter a debate about, well, how do we want these rules to change? But do you feel time? it's always an honest exchange? Or do you feel politicians grandstand when they're, you know, when they're on TV? I've got a very strong personal view that these are the representatives of the people and, and that they come from a range of backgrounds. So what you find is, 
You've got some people who are extremely well informed and some people who are very uninformed about technology. And I think you've seen this, you know, people won't have seen me in these situations necessarily, but they might have seen Mark Zuckerberg or our CEO, Sundar Pichai in DC, um, being asked questions. And, you know, it, it shows you the range of savviness there is about these technologies. And it means, I think, that we have to explain ourselves better. That's quite challenging, you know, explaining, you know, under GDPR, how all the data settings work on a website as you have to do or we have to do in a way that's both simple and comprehensive, this is a challenging thing to do. But I do think that that kind of scrutiny reflects the public and therefore you should be subject to it. And, you know, I think I, um, I, I really believe that we need to have more of that. Ideally, not always with the temperature turned up to 11 because then you can actually learn um, from each other. And what about the media? Because, I mean, Google's mm. quite shy mm. of media. I mean, you, you do appear on, on, on TV and radio, mm. but relatively rarely. Why is that? Well, I think there are stories about Google and the internet and YouTube and so on almost every day of the week. And you just, you just can't spend your time. You could you be know, doffed up every night. You, yes. well, <laughs> uh, yeah, having robust questions is a, and, and answer, having the chance to answer them is something that is important for us to do. But you could be, you could be doing it all the time. And I don't want to criticize the media at all, but it is the case that in certain sections, you know, the internet is threatening um, the power of um, very large media that had, you know, was, was the loudest megaphone in the room. And I think sometimes that can feel like it's playing through into the scrutiny of, of tech companies. Now, um, wherever there's a story about something which we haven't got right, we absolutely need to kind of address it. And, and I wouldn't claim that then there's anything unfair about that treatment, but I think you have to recognize that there's this disruption going on and you think newspapers have pursued you because you challenged their dominance? No, I think, but I, I think that you know that, that must be a factor in in some of the um, coverage that happens. It's not necessarily individual stories, but you know the um, uh, the prominence of some of the coverage, you know, maybe a factor there. I'm not complaining about that. That's part of uh, that's part of life. And actually, you know, I was with the CEO of one of the big newspaper groups yesterday, and as with all of them, you know, our relationship is multifaceted. So what are we doing? We're trying to help them um, grow the audience for their content. So 10 billion times a month, people come to Google and ask us about the news. And 10 billion times a month, we connect people with one of 80,000 news publishers. They're all who they say they are. They all employ journalists. There's a huge spectrum of political views, but you know that's a huge amount of traffic that goes to news publishers. The second thing we try to do is help fund content. Um, and so through advertising, we bring advertisers that the publishers would never normally have a relationship with, and any money that's spent on advertising, the publisher gets the majority. And that's to the tune of about $14 billion globally last year. So we help them to um, get their content out there, to make money, and then we work really hard to stop the bad actors and the fakers. So, you know, we read a lot about fake news, and it's, it's probably more of a phenomenon of social media. You know, the idea that you can misrepresent and get, get to scale really quickly is something that comes through social media and with, with Google people are largely coming to us and asking us about a story. But one of the reasons people are doing that is because they think they can make money. And so what we try to do is ensure that they can't use our programs of advertising sharing revenue to make money by raising the bar on misrepresentation. I think we kicked out over 300,000 sites from that program last year as we raised the bar on misrepresentation. So there is a battle for truth uh, going on. And you know it's really in our interests as somebody in the inter information business to help quality content cut through and thrive against the fakers. But is there any incentive, and this is a conversation I've had with Facebook as well, mm. to allow um, bad stuff to thrive because you make money from it? No, I mean, that's an extremely sort of short term view, right? You know, if people will only come and use our products and services if they think they're get, getting what they need from them. And um, actually, thanks to things like Google search, you know, the next best alternative is, is just a click away. So there's, there's, you know, short, short term, you know, making money is never the right thing to do in my view for any business, but certainly for us, because the alternatives are, you know, a, a microsecond away. And therefore what we have to do is try and get it right. Now we don't always get it right, but I do think we've got a lot of people um, taking external input and um, developing tools and, and policies to try to ensure that we're getting it right more and more often. And don't forget, you know, Go back to Tim Berners-Lee and the foundation of the web. Um, almost everything we do online is wholly or partly funded by advertising. Social media, games, maps, search, uh, journalism, you know, all of it earns a return from advertising. And so making advertising work in a way that's not annoying for users actually is useful, uh, that pays for content creators 
and uh, um, is transparent and works for advertisers. It's one of the things that's most important for us if we want to have an open web that works not just for the first half of the planet that's come online, but for everybody that's come online. And we spend an awful lot of time um, trying to make sure that that can continue. You're, you're very disciplined um, at not talking about other people. <laughs> And it's that, you know, in that you, 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 you don't often sort of talk about what Facebook have done yeah. or Twitter or anybody else. And um, is, that, is that difficult? I mean, is that, is that just sort of one of the disciplines you have to have as a business leader? Or, you know, because we've been in a period in which other big um, technology giants have been through an awful lot of controversy. Mm -hmm. And people often want you to comment. Yeah, um, I think I've got a personal point of view, which is, you know... Um, Stick to what you know about, and what I know about is what, what Google's doing, but also what, my, what I personally see in terms of how people are using technology every day. And I don't have a full picture on Facebook and others. Um, it's definitely the case that uh, it's easy to write about big tech and group us all together. And I think, you know, from the inside, it feels like these are companies with very, very different models and approaches. So if you think about, you know, Amazon, which is all about helping you buy things online and connecting you at scale with merchants. It's a very different model from Google, which is all about information in the open web. Think about Facebook, it's about getting you to come to their platform and spend time on it. Google is all about getting you to come to our platform and get off it as quickly as possible for what you're looking for. It's a totally different um, model and therefore different challenges. And uh, if you think about Apple, it's about making amazing hardware and software combined and controlling everything so that the experience is brilliant, even if there's less choice. So I think, you know, these, these are companies with very different sort of business models. But well, how, how do we protect ourselves from the future? Because we've already, all, already established that we never know what's around the corner. Yeah. And we don't know what the real potential of one piece of technology is. Because yeah. you can't foresee how it's going to be used. Um, so how, how do we keep ourselves safe? Individually? Yeah. Uh, I think, and again, very crude analogy, but, you know, as a parent, let's start, start there. Um, I would not have, my parents would not have said to me, go into WH Smith and read every magazine in WH Smith when I was seven. And I think there's a, you know, there's a parental responsibility to help, you know, kids understand what's out there and, and sort of manage our access. So there's a, there's a bunch of things like that. Actually, I think parents do struggle a bit with um, uh, their generation of children uh, are growing up in a digital native world, as people call it. And, and as parents, most of the people parenting today didn't grow up in that world at the moment. Um, we've done some things going into classrooms with teachers and making available resources for children to sort of think about how to be safe online. Then there's sort of keeping yourself secure online. So protecting yourself against hacking and cyber attacks and, and so on and so forth. And at Google, because of the range of properties we've got from sort of Gmail and photos to Drive and YouTube and so on, we see pretty much any kind of attack uh, every day of the week in you know, malware and malicious people trying to get hold of your data. So really trying to make sure your personal information like mail and drive and photos and so on is totally secure online, your payment credentials, really important and working hard to do that. And then there's um, more sort of to do with privacy. So what do I do online? And to what extent is, is what I do used by people in a way that I understand? So for example, um, you know, when, I, when I go to your website and, and read some content there and I go to um, a retailer website and I look at some stuff there and then you know the pair of shoes I was looking at follows me around the internet we've all had that experience not a great experience try to stop that but how do you sort of think about that kind of data which is not me you know British male age X doing this but it's just somebody looked at shoes and then they went to look at Channel 4 News or whatever how do you deal with that And I think those are those are things where we work hard to try to make it as simple and understandable as possible for people to control but not everybody you know, wants to explore and understand that. Are you personally very cautious about your own data? Uh, yeah, I think so. I've, uh, so one thing I've always tried to do is not post pictures and so on of my family online because I feel like I'm not massively a uh, big social media user because um, I think I'm, you know, relatively private as a British man of my generation. It's probably not um, surprising. Um, but yeah, I do think you have to be thoughtful about your privacy. And you should make your own choices. Some people want to be out there and sharing everything, and that's absolutely great. But you've got control and you've got choice. You know, there's an analogy here to something like food safety. You know, like, so how many people in the supermarket read the labels on every product? Not that many. Some do. You know, they might have an allergy or they might just be really interested in, in you know, where things come from. But everybody who buys from the supermarket trusts that the supermarket's doing a good job of keeping them safe and healthy online. And I think that's what we need to do. We need to ensure that everyone's safe, 
not just the people who are interested in you know, reading the small print and, and um, managing the settings. On an individual level, though, I mean, aren't, there are also things that you could do as a, as a company. You know, to the parent who's trying to stop their kid mm. watching YouTube all mm. the time, um, one of the problems is instant start, isn't it? You know, it's an automatic yeah. start. Yeah. Um, that's something designed to keep people on your platform yeah. when addiction is a problem. Yeah, and so one of the things which we've done in response to exactly that is we built Family Link, which is a way in which a parent can control Android devices that their children have. So you can do things like decide which sites you're allowing them to see or not see, how long you're going to allow them in different apps and sort of see what the digital well-being is. And actually on a broader level, you know, we're all, I think, conscious of the role that digital plays in our lives. Uh, increasingly, you see us building sort of digital well-being nudges into devices. So I've got an Android phone here. Um, I could turn on a, a grayscale setting, which means that at a certain time in the evening, everything goes black and white. And actually, watching videos or being on social media is quite a lot less interesting when it's in monochrome. Um, you said something about so growing up in the 1970s. So you can control these things if you, if you know how. Yeah, well, I think, yeah. um, you know, you could just say I should be self-disciplined and put my phone down at 9 o'clock at night, but actually that nudge really does help. And giving people the data as you have on Apple and other devices as well to see how much screen time am I spending, this is all really helpful. So I think we're at an early stage, individually, as a society, and in terms of governments, of figuring out the new norms for this metropolis that is the digital world. But in, um, in, the, in the sort of the connected home, you know, in the home where I've got, you know, a, a couple of different devices that I can talk to, whether it's an Amazon one or a Google one or an Apple one that, that are listening to me all the time. Mm. I've got a fridge that knows what food I've got and when mm. I need to do my food shop. Um, you've got all these connected devices. At what point do I lose control of my life? Well, I think if you choose to use devices and services where you feel you have some control and there are controls built in, I think that's that's helpful. I'm not sure you lose control of your life. Well, in, in, the, in, what do you in, mean? in that in that. Google or Amazon or whoever it might be starts to know so much about me um, without me really realizing I've given away so much of myself. Um, you know, do I really have any privacy left? I, so this is something that I think comes up a lot as a sort of top line question. You know, I'll meet somebody and I'll say, well, you probably know more about me than I do. Haha. <laughs> and actually, um, I've started saying, well, hang on a minute, um, because if you think about Google, you know, our services, particularly search, doesn't need to know anything about you at all. In fact, I don't care. What you are is somebody in Newcastle looking for car insurance for a car like this, or what you are is somebody trying to understand how to play, you know, this tune on a guitar. And our whole model, both the, the services, but also the way that advertising work is based on connecting somebody um, who wants to do something, who wants to go somewhere, who wants to learn something not to do with who they are at all. But what I mean is we've created a capability that can be abused, and there yeah. might be countries in which it could be. OK, well, that's you a know, if, you, if you go to China, uh, then, then, you know, maybe the government does want to know those things about yeah. people. Yeah. So, so that's, I think that's a different question. So the, I was talking really about, you know, us individually and how we sort of take control and how we manage that and, and, and how technology companies can work. It's true that the rules are very different in different countries in different societies. And you mentioned China. You know, I think we'll see over the next 10 years a real acceleration of technology innovation coming out of China. Most of us in Europe don't see that because we don't see many Chinese services and apps. But the um, investment that's going on into computer science, machine learning, leading edge research, and the rather different attitude they have to data uh, at scale, I think um, you know, does suggest that there'll be a huge wave of innovation coming out of China and coming out of Asia. And already, I think we see different consumer behaviors and different amounts of innovation coming out But there. can we protect ourselves from totalitarian regimes wanting to misuse that? Or is that just something that, you know, it will creep up on us one day somewhere in the world mm. and we'll go, why didn't we see this coming? This is, you know, this is a great question. I think it's partly why it's so important that we don't have technology players and politicians sort of shouting past each other. We actually need to have conversations about well, what kind of digital world do we want to be in? I do think governments have a real role to play in shaping the rules of the road for their citizens and their society. And I think you're seeing that, you know, Europe with GDPR, the data protection regulations, with the e-privacy directive, which is what's led to the sort of cookie stuff that you see in Europe, has already said we want a different kind of internet from the US. I mean, you say you don't want this data for any reason other than to help mm -hmm. us. The data is presumably being an analyzed in some form, isn't it? Yeah, so you took the by, think about- by your Supercomputers. Yeah. So if you think about the data, there's, there's a couple of categories. You know, 
there's there's your stuff like your Gmail or your photos or whatever. That's that's for you. What do we do with any data like that? Well, we we might um, run technology over it to sort of filter out spam, to keep you secure, to help you find you know a photograph of a cat without having to label it as a cat or whatever. But that's very different from the sort of digital footprint data about your activity online. And again, go to my account at Google or the Google account, and you can see you know, if you've chosen to opt into any of our services, how the data is being used. So when you think about Google and your relationship with, with, with our services and tools, um, actually the way we use data about what you're doing on them, not who you are, is almost always to improve that service. So think about search, we serve up some results to a question, you click the fourth result rather than the top result, so do a load of other people, that fourth result should probably be higher up the list. That's the kind of way we use information and data um, in order to improve our services. And in most cases, now that people have mobile devices, um, sharing a location uh, with Google is helpful because it means that we can give you results not for restaurants at random, but for those near you or whatever, and people choose to, to do that. I think we need to work hard at trying to make that, what data are we using and giving you visibility of that and control of that even easier to see and control. Now, I think you should be able to use all of our services in a sort of logged out mode and still get pretty good answers. And in, in many cases, you can. Um, you can use sort of incognito mode on search, for example, and it won't necessarily give you things that are close to you, but it will get a decent sort of service. Can I also ask you about, about um, you know, the, the business as an employer? I mean, because we, we thought with the creation of all these new technology companies with their amazing offices and amazing workspaces and different ways of working and... Um, you know, uh, unconventional office space, that th these must all be amazing places to, to work and, and be employed. But as time goes on, it turns out that, you know, you have walkouts too, you have industrial disputes of different kinds. Um, you know, do you think you're finding out that actually as you become a corporate giant, you are basically just like every other big employer? Well, I think um, companies are full of people and people are full of joy and flaws uh, you know everywhere you go and i think what we've seen you, know, you, you you're referring i think to sort of high profile stories uh, last year well there was a walkout last Indeed. year wasn't there over yeah. over a, over a payoff over sexual harassment yeah. and there have been lots of concerns about that and and the, the terms and conditions under which yeah. people are employed at one point all google people had to have forced arbitration in, in disputes, the US, that's right. and that's gone now yeah. but what i mean is you know so you sort of you had this impression of being very different do you think you really were? That's a great question. So in this particular area, so um, I actually was very supportive of, of the walkouts, which were a protest at this high profile case. Um, and people were saying, look, you know, we actually have a high bar for this company. We believe in the mission of the company about information. Uh, we, we value our colleagues. And this is not the kind of company I thought I worked for. And I want to see it change. And um, the, the, the way those were organized uh, was thoughtful and constructive but it was also outraged. And, and that's a moment for all of us as, a, as, as leaders to say, right, we need to make some changes. And we have internally in, in the way that um, we deal with the investigations and, and you know, concerns on, on that kind of behavior. Um, but it's also a company that encourages uh, people to be in the flow of what's going on and to express an opinion. Now, I think that's really healthy, although it can be challenging. So on something like you know, the behavior at work, everybody has a point of view and everybody's point of view is valid. On other things like, you know, should we be doing this or that or the other? Everybody's got a point of view, but ultimately you need some people to make decisions on those things. So it's absolutely, you know, it's not a company that runs by referenda, but it is a company that encourages everyone to have a voice. And, and is a company which has so many computer engineers in it, does it, is it a different kind of workforce? Now, I remember talking to one of your former colleagues who told me that Google had an unusually high number of people with autism, for example, yeah. in yeah. the workforce. Yeah. Yeah, so... Um, there's definitely sort of there's engineers and then there's everybody else. And it's a bit like, you know, the talent in a um, you know, TV company uh, or the sort of the journalists in the suit in, in media or, you know, the, you can think of lots of organizations that have sort of the kind of two types of people. And I think, you know, um, we employ lots of people who are brilliant mathematicians and scientists and they tend to have, you know, absolutely that some of that is associated with autism and, uh, and, and you know, other types of um, different ways of thinking. Uh, and I think that does mean that the culture can be quite challenging um, in a healthy way uh, and sometimes in an unhealthy way. Um, but I think that's, you know, it's the diversity that breeds creativity in every organization. And that diversity, particularly of um, 
background, upbringing, you know, cultures and countries that people have come from, hugely creative, to be led by somebody who grew up in India um, with very limited access to technology, who's really determined to put great technology in the hands of you know, the rising generations in Asia, hugely motivating and inspiring. Um, one of the things we don't have enough diversity in is gender. And I think, you know, typically when you talk about engineers, you know, the number of women going into science, technology and engineering and maths is low. And we published our diversity stats several years ago to sort of say, we're not doing well enough, we need to do better. Very, very hard to move the needle um, very fast in that area because you actually have to get right back into, well, how do we convince more girls to go into maths? And I actually think, you know, what we're learning over time is it's not just hardcore computer science, but actually there's a range of roles that are really important if you're going to get technology to work for lots of people, including business development, including product management, where potentially there is more opportunity to bring in people from other backgrounds. So we've got a challenge, which is to reflect all the users that we want to work for. Today, we don't. We're not diverse enough in gender. We're not actually diverse enough culturally across the world. And we don't ref re uh, reflect in every country the minority groups that are really important. And if you want to build products that work for everyone, they kind of need to be built by everyone. And so that's a mission which will take some time to fix. And do you know how you can? I th as I say, I think it's, it's, it's quite slow. There are things that you can do to try to, um, you know, remove bias from some of the hiring processes. And lots of companies are going through this, you know, how you write your role specs, how you think about shortlisting candidates, the, the pools you go in. Do, do you have a sort of a, a list of things you would like to do secretly? I mean, um, everybody who comes on the podcast gets asked, you know, if, if, if you were, you know, if, if, if you were in charge suddenly, how would you change the world? Yeah. Do you have a... A secret list? Well, I mean, personally, I'd like to win that Olympic gold medal. It eluded me. I think it may be a, a bit late. Um, I really am excited by the way in which you see people using technology to learn and the creativity that that can unlock in people. And so I suppose, you know, close to my heart in the day job is, you know, what if you could make that technology available to everyone in Africa and they were able to learn from each other, learn from people around the world and innovate? And I think you know, that would be tremendous for society. It would definitely bring more challenges as we talked about earlier, but I just think overwhelmingly positive and seeing what people do with technology. I'm not personally that excited about the technology itself. I'm excited about what people do with it. What is good is obviously subjective, but if you run a giant like Google, you could just say, this is what we think is good. Mm. Let's promote that. Yeah, I think that would start to fall down pretty quickly because I think pe what people have learned to expect from search and from Google in particular is the ability to research across everything and to see a range of opinions. And when you look at surveys, actually people trust search quite highly relative to other sources. I think partly because they see a range of links. They see a range of options in front of them. They can go and see different things. And I think that richness is really important. I suppose what I mean is but this is often put to you as a threat to democracy. What you could be is a threat to the far right totalitarianism, communism, if you wanted, you know, whatever, you know, you could just say, these are the things we think are good. Let's just favor all that. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's possible that one could choose to intervene in all kinds of different ways. From the start, the way that search has been set up is to try to avoid that. And this balance of like, um, freedom of information, accessing the world's content, particularly on search, that's not, you know, search is, we're not hosting people's content there, we're, we're linking to the web back to Berners-Lee's original vision, which is people connect, connect to the web and share content in the way that they want to across the web. Um, and trying to represent that diversity still remains pretty important uh, in terms of what users are looking for. Matt Britton, thank you very much indeed.